Hello and welcome to Showcase, TR2 World's daily arts and culture show coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Today we take a look back at two quintessential sci-fi movies that have both turned 50. Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey and The Planet of the Apes. And talk to a film critic about how they set the tone for the others that followed. But first... At Home Within, how this group of Syrian artists are telling a story of war in their own way. But we begin the show with a story about how an innovative and unconventional form of calligraphy is tackling the collective Arab consciousness of Palestine. Bahraini artist Abbas Yusuf's work is multi-layered in more ways than one. Showcase's Carrie Alexandra went to see his unique approach to classical Arabic calligraphy, which he describes as being a comment on the fate of Palestine. As you walk into the room, you're met with a wall of colour. Intense, vivid shades decorate huge canvases. Yusuf's work weaves beautiful Arabic calligraphy into ornate designs, his delicate brush strokes committing words to canvas in an unusual way. Layer upon layer of paint, of fine Arabic letters, painstakingly applied so many times that the artist himself has lost count. I'm working on a pair of layers, layer on layer, layer, you know, uh, layer, erase layer, and another layer has come up, and after that, you know, uh, layers uh, erase the, the, uh, the last one, until I reach this result. But there's more to his work than words lost under layers of paint. It's a representation of layers of history, a lost people, a lost land, and a lost heritage. The history of Palestine and Jerusalem, or Al-Quds, as Yusuf affectionately refers to it by its Arabic name. He feels has been erased and written over, but just like the layers of his calligraphy, it's still there if you care to look. Our artist listens to the themes of the Arab world and creates his own ideas accordingly. Yusuf transcribes the words of Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darvish across his canvases, painting images of Palestine into the very deepest layers of his work, a reflection of the way Palestine is etched onto the deepest layers of the Arab subconscious. The very title of the exhibition, This Is Your Name, hints at the quiet collective consciousness of Palestine in the Arab world. Yusuf is saying, this is your name, this is your history. You know, uh, you know uh, Mahmoud, Mahmoud Darwish always talking about freedom, about uh, human being, uh, about Palestine, about about the Quds, and which is for me it's very very important. Palestine it means uh, something for me. The experimental nature of the work is what makes it interesting. Traditional Arabic calligraphy has an inclination to leave a space between decoration and design. But Yusuf's words overlap and bleed into each other. It's hard to tell where one phrase ends and another begins. The final result isn't simply a well-known poem or passage in beautifully written script, but something more, something that started with the script but became something else. The result is a feeling of familiar words washing over you, as if people are speaking somewhere in the distance and you recognise the language, but you can't quite make out the words. Kerry Alexandra, TRT World, Istanbul. A Syrian composer and a Syrian-Armenian visual artist. The two have been working together as part of a project called Home Within. Through their performance that mirrors seven years of war, the artists want to make the world aware of what is happening in Syria. Kinan Azma's clarinet, combined with Kivork Murat's live sketches. 
Their performance reflects the war that has made their country unrecognizable. The two New York-based artists launched Home Within six years ago. Before coming to Beirut, they toured North America and Europe. Like the art I do doesn't stop a bullet, it doesn't bring a, a free democratic secular Syria, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, bring back people who, you know, who died. It simply doesn't. It doesn't rebuild the house even. But what it does, it gives us a reason to live, I think. The two describe their performance as a sort of dialogue that has evolved with the war. I draw, it becomes a single story. It becomes about, let's say, family. It's about, uh, let's say, a boat and, and people are in it. But, and then when I zoom out, let's say, the, the, the first frame, it's about many people. It becomes about the entire country. Of course, it's, it's scary. If, if I start thinking about that, I might not be able to do this. With Home Within, the artists hope to raise funds for Syrian refugees, but most importantly, also awareness about the situation in the Middle Eastern country. It's nice and it's sad at the same time. One feels for the country and the situation there. The music touched our hearts and we felt what our country is going through. Many Syrian artists, both those who left and those who stayed, document their nation's suffering and say their art is a necessity rather than a luxury. Still to come on Showcase, revisiting the future. The 9000 series is the most reliable computer ever made. Stanley Kubrick's science fiction classic celebrates its semi-centennial. And we'll look at another futuristic dystopian classic also celebrating its 50th. But before we bring you those, let's first take a quick look at some other arts and culture stories that caught our eye. Turkish writer and illustrator Hasan Aijin is marking 40 years of making art with an exhibition in Jerusalem. He's known for addressing the problems of the world's oppressed in his work. The Palestinian Minister of Jerusalem Affairs was among the dignitaries at the opening. Amid thawing tension between the two Koreas, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un enjoyed a night of music from the South in Pyongyang on Sunday. The lineup at the Spring Is Coming concert included K-pop girl band Red Velvet. Kim said he was deeply moved by the performance. Stanley Kubrick has a reputation for being a director who divides audience opinion. But when it comes to his seminal science fiction epic, 2001 A Space Odyssey, the verdict today is that it's one of the most innovative pieces of filmmaking in history. And to mark its 50th anniversary, we decided to revisit this timeless classic. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. At the time when high-concept science fiction movies were unheard of, director Stanley Kubrick pitched his pet project 2001 A Space Odyssey to Hollywood studio Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. It was the success of his previous motion picture, Dr. Strangelove, that persuaded executives to greenlight this risky production. The big budget allowed 2001 to use innovative filmmaking techniques and presented collaboration opportunities with 50 different scientific organizations for authentication. The hard work paid off when the feature won an Oscar for Best Special Effects and high praise from NASA. The 9000 series is the most reliable computer ever made. Telling the tale of a space mission aiming to examine a monolith found on the moon, the film has been the subject of serious analysis by professionals from various different fields. 
Kubrick's vision is generally understood to be an allegory of human conception, birth and death. Today, A Space Odyssey is also receiving a claim for its foresight regarding technologies that involve visual communication and aerospace engineering. Fans believe this to be a testament to the genius of its visionary creator. Our guest today struggles to watch a movie without thinking of a brilliant explainer and smart commentary. Alex Leadbeater has been writing reviews online for all sorts of films for years, and he is currently the features editor for ScreenRants.com. Thank you so much for joining us today, Alex. Now, Alex, tell me how significant is 2001 A Space Odyssey 50 years after it was created? Well, what's so interesting about 2001 is that it's from Stanley Kubrick, and Stanley Kubrick is someone who has done so many different genres, and yet, you know, despite doing historical movies, uh, horrors, and all sorts, 2001 stands as probably his biggest and most influential because it dealt with such big themes, it dealt with such big ideas. In terms of sci-fi, it is almost like a year zero sort of movie. It defined a lot of modern sci-fi. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit about the film's production process and how Kubrick chose and worked with his collaborators? Well, what I think is very interesting about 2001, and perhaps not very well known, is that it's actually just one part of a bigger multimedia project. Uh, it's based on a short story by Arthur C. Clarke called The Sentinel, and alongside Kubrick developing the movie, Clarke wrote the 2001 novel, and they weren't based on each other, they were written and developed concurrently, which means that to get the full 2001 experience, you really have to read the book as well as watch the movie. And so, from the very start, this was a movie where Kubrick, who is a very you know, famous perfectionist, was trying to create something bigger than himself. And so, you know, from the very start, he was working with another writer. But then, throughout the development of the movie, he worked closely with NASA and with lots of other scientists to create this world. It was very much a, he had a vision and he was going to get whoever he needed to build that. Well, that kind and it of, shows in the movie, of course. Yes, that kind of brings me to my next question. It was certainly a very revolutionary uh, film in terms of production techniques, but tell us how it predicted certain technologies that didn't even exist when it was made. Well, what Kubrick did, and this does tie into the NASA thing, he got them to project the futures. This is, obviously in 2001, we did not have space travel, we did not have AI, but the version of space travel that he shows is very accurate, even though we're not there yet. But then if you go deeper, there's, there's video phone calls. There's, uh, there's AI that has some similarities to you know, what we have with like, you know, Siri nowadays. And it's very startling, especially in the sort of earlier stuff when they're on the moon. And you look at that and you think, oh, that is basically what we have now, except you know, just on mm -hmm. Earth instead of the moon. And I think that really came from Kubrick's focus on creating something defined. The mm -hmm. only thing it didn't predict was the internet. Yep. All right, Alex, tell me what your absolute favorite scene is in the movie. My favorite scene in the movie has to be the ending, uh, when uh, the astronaut goes to the, I mean, all the Hal stuff is excellent, but the ending where he goes into the Stargate and he's sort of accelerated through aging and transcends to be this other being. It's, it's one of the most pure moments of cinema that's ever been done. If you can get to see it on the big screen, I would really recommend it. Well, 2001 A Space Odyssey is considered a milestone in film history, but where does it stand when it comes to director Stanley Kubrick's filmography? Well, the thing about Stanley Kubrick is he has directed so many different types of movies, so it's very hard to compare them. You can't exactly compare 2001 to The Shining. They're completely different. But if you get objective about it, in terms of actual filmmaking craft, in terms of the ideas it's trading in, in terms of the emotions that it leaves you with, I think 2001 has to be regarded as his best film. Um, just because it is doing so much and it hits it exactly right. It's technically perfect, it's emotionally perfect. That's all I have to say. It is a spectacular movie. So, Alex, what film do you think was the most influenced by 2001? I think to single out any one film is nigh on impossible. Uh, 2001 sh reshaped the sci-fi genre. Uh, you know, it would be reinvigorated in about 10 years later with Star Wars and the used future, but the idea of this a real future that's extrapolated from where we are now is defined by 2001. Uh, this isn't the movie that's most defined by it, but I think it shows its influence. There's a new movie that's out on Netflix internationally called Annihilation, 
and that's just been released, and that is heavily influenced by 2001. Even 50 years later, you can watch a new movie and go, oh, that is directly linked to 2001. I think that shows its influence. All right, thanks for that, Alex. We'll be back to talk to you about another sci-fi classic a little later on in the show. Around the same time 2001, A Space Odyssey was released, another film set in the not-too-distant future appeared on the big screen. Planet of the Apes hit theaters in April 1968, leaving audiences astounded by its groundbreaking visual effects and, some might say, its uncomfortable subject matter. Adapted from the 1963 French novel La Planète de Singe, the plot of the first Apes movie revolved around an astronaut in the distant future who crash-landed on a planet. There he discovered that intelligent talking apes had become the dominant species and enslaved humans. 20th Century Fox's Planet of the Apes was not only a major step forward for the science fiction genre, but for cinema in general, thanks to groundbreaking special effects and makeup. The film was so successful it spawned four sequels, 1970's Beneath the Planet of the Apes, 1971's Escape from the Planet of the Apes, 1972's Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, and Battle for the Planet of the Apes in 1973. Then the franchise lay dormant for nearly 30 years, until US director Tim Burton decided to take the reins and reinvent the sci-fi classic. 2001's Planet of the Apes featured Mark Wahlberg in the lead role, but although Burton's remake followed the same story as the 1968 hit, it was poorly received by the fans. It wasn't until 2011 that Rise of the Planet of the Apes managed to salvage the franchise. Following a different plot this time around, audiences saw how the apes evolved to take over the planet. Like the 1968 original, this version made full use of the latest technological advances. Motion capture tech transformed actor Andy Serkis into Caesar, the ape who leads a revolt against humans, and his performance captivated audiences. Thanks to the success of Rise of the Planet of the Apes, two sequels followed, 2014's Dawn of a Planet of the Apes and the most recent, 2017's Wolf of a Planet of the Apes. The Apes franchise may have had its ups and downs over the last 50 years, but its contributions to the science fiction genre, from the groundbreaking use of visual effects and prosthetics, to the mirror it held up to society, has left a lasting legacy. Let's cross back over to London to speak to Alex Leadbeater again, but this time about the planet of the apes. Welcome back, uh, Alex. Now, how was the reboot trilogy different from the initial sequence that was created between 1968 and 1973? Well, the big difference is obviously how they made the apes. In the original, it was cutting edge makeup techniques, and in the uh, prequels, uh, it's CGI mocap. Uh, and that is a big difference, and it changes how the apes look. But I think the bigger thing is how it changes how we feel about the apes. In the original uh, series, especially in the earlier movies, the apes are the antagonists, the apes are the villains. It, it's horrifying that the world's been taken over by apes. Whereas in the new ones, the apes are our main characters. We sympathize with them. By the end of the third movie, you almost want the apes to win. They make a case against humanity. So I think the big difference is that the protagonists have completely flipped. We now care for who were once the villains. Mm -hmm. So, Escape from the Planet of the Apes is described as one of the few films in the franchise to fully break the mold. Why is that? Oh, I love Escape. Um, so, the, obviously the original Planet of the Apes ends with the Statue of Liberty reveal, it's all on Earth. And the second one, Charlton Heston didn't want to come back for it. And so the only way they could get him to return was that if he, he made it so there were no more sequels, there could be no more sequels. And so they destroyed the Earth, they destroyed the Planet of the Apes at the end of the second one. Uh, which left them in a bit of a bind when they wanted to make more. And so for Escape from the Planet Apes, they tore up the rule book and they sent some apes from the future back in time and basically reversed the original movie. So instead of it being a human going to the planet of the apes, it was apes going to the planet of the humans, the 1970s. And it, it's interesting because it does have a lot of similarities to Pierre Boulle's original novel, but it is a completely different movie. And that is the point where you begin to see mm -hmm. sympathies lie with the apes and not with the humans. Well, Alex, you said earlier that you absolutely love 
that specific movie. Why? Um, it's just so funny. It's it's very dated. Obviously, it's set in you know the I think the movie came out in 1971, and it's set around that era. It's very contemporary, and so it has a lot of weird 70s hallmarks. But just the level of comedy, the way that you can take this movie, the you know Planet of the Apes is quite a deep movie series, especially in the new ones, and have some fun with it while still probing those ideas. It works really well, and it's got a killer twist at the end. So why do you think they keep on making remakes? of this movie? I mean, cynically, it's because people want to go see them. People enjoy seeing these movies. But I think the new three, especially, have shown that there's actually more to tell with these stories. Planet of the Apes isn't just a story of a man who goes into the future and discovers, oh no, my world's been taken over by apes. It's not that simple. There's a whole underlying class and societal structure there that was discussed in the original movies quite heavily, but there is more to do. And I think it's relevant. Planet of the Apes speaks to our primal fear of humanity being wiped out, whether it's by nuclear war in the originals or uh, virus experimentation in the modern day. Planet of the Apes is always relevant and can evolve with our uh, modern fears. Mm -hmm. So tell me about some examples of films that were influenced by uh, Planet of the Apes in terms of exploring race relations? Well, that, that's what I said. That, that is such a good aspect of Planet of the Apes. So you have, obviously, the human-ape divide, but then you also have, within the ape society, tiers. You have uh, the chimpanzees, then the orangutans at the top, and the gorillas at the bottom. So everything is built in a very specific way. Uh, and you can feel that in stuff like Alien Nation and V, the TV series, that you know, looked at um, racial and uh, societal differences through aliens. But I think that's disingenuous to Planet of the Apes to say those are the only influences. If you look at something like Blade Runner, which exists in a society that is similarly uh, stru structured between humans and the replicants, that's got some hallmarks dating back to, you know, the stuff in Planet of the Apes. And I think because the idea with the apes is that we evolved from them and yet they've taken over, there's an element of our own doing to it. So I think mm -hmm. you can feel it in stuff like Blade Runner and uh, anything relating to robotics, almost. Mm -hmm. Well, there are some rumors out there about there being an addition to the trilogy. If they do make a new movie, do you think it will again be based on a war of apes against human beings? A fourth one would be tricky because, uh, not to spoil it for viewers, but the final one, War for the Planet of the Apes, has a very resolute ending. It ends and it wraps up the story of the trilogy. But we are not at the original Planet of the Apes when that movie ends, so there's definitely room for more. I personally feel that we've done the actual war between humans and apes, and I think if we're going to get more, I think we'll go much more into the apes. We'll either have a story that looks at how the apes form a society from the rubble of humanity, or what I would really like, and this is a bit of a controversial idea, is to have a straight remake of the original movie, but told from the apes' perspectives. So do the descendants of Andy Serkis's character discovering a human, and go full circle in this reimagining of Planet of the Apes. Well, I would love to see an addition being made to the franchise. Alex, thank you so much for joining us on our show today. It was a pleasure having you. As we wrap up another edition of Showcase, let's remember an early master of the fairy tale, Hans Christian Andersen. The Danish author was born on the 2nd of April, 1805. But two centuries on, his stories still both scare and delight children around the world. Thanks for watching today's show. You can find Showcase stories about the global art scene on our YouTube channel. I'm Efnan Han. Bye for now.